and I hear she's fantastic. You can go I've see heard some of my amazing. former students uh, in Bright Star at Playmakers. They opened last weekend and run till next Saturday. Um, and uh, RLT is doing two things this week. They open their uh, student production of Antigone, which is a nice little tale of revolution for our time. And um, uh, Lamar Jones is uh, directing uh, Dominique uh, Mercero's uh, Blood at the Root, and that is, oh, wow. um, uh, has roles for young black men and women um, and uh, mid-30s, uh, all ages. The casting breakdown is an RLT's uh, uh, website right now, um, and she's auditioning it tonight and tomorrow. So oh, wow. that's one to go be a part of. They go up in September, but they're auditioning that right now, and I would hate for anybody to miss that opportunity. So, yeah, yeah that's, def- that's what I'm going to do because, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, I have a question that has nothing to do with you. Let's put it this way. If you were to give a uh, play that that person that's sitting there in the D.C. area should go see uh, to hopefully get him in the right direction, what would that play be? Oh, playing right now? Hmm. Either playing right now or that he could go see anywhere that he could like, pick up a book or a, a copy of it. Just whatever play you feel that he needs to watch in order to get him in a better see, direction. that's a hard thing. So, like, where to start? There, You know, there are American masters. There are, there are things that are really easy to get into. I think Fences is one of the most accessible uh, 20th century plays. August Wilson is just brilliant. Like I don't, I, I don't ever hear anybody read Fences that walks away not feeling like they have an understanding of that experience of being a wife or that experience of being a, a, a father or being a son and trying to get out from underneath or family who's ill. I just think Fences by August Wilson is the most accessible. Now, who I'm reading right now, I have a giant cru- – like, black young black women are ripping up the theater world right now. Like, that's who I'm reading voraciously. Kirsten Greenwich and Lydia Diamond and Dominique Mercero. Dominique Mercero's stuff is just lays me on my backside. She's amazing. And I think that Justice Theater Project is putting up her, um, uh, one of hers, no, Lynn Nottage. Lynn Nottage's sweat is up next, next spring. If you're going to see anything, I think, as far as, like, the, the quality of the script and the potential for that show to just be mesmerizing, Justice Theater Project sweat next spring. Yep, that's what I would go see. She's our Pulitzer Prize winner. Lynn Nottage is amazing. So yeah, that's, she's definitely that's amazing. That. Who are you reading and yeah. seeing right now? <laughs> I'm interested in seeing quite a bit. We've actually got um, Speed Done Killed by uh, Cousin, which will be playing at Haiti in uh, the 17th, and I believe the Carpet Bagger Theater out of uh, the Northeast is coming down to bring that. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And there's a couple of uh, plays that will be going on. I need to look at the list. But every two years I go to the National Black Theater Festival down there in Winston-Salem. The legendary Larry oh. Leon Hamlin created that. And I have friends that were involved in the uh, planning of that early initial stages. So that was formed in the late 80s, early 90s. But uh, definitely looking yeah. forward to looking at that list and seeing what kind of amazing theater is just coming from around the world. Because they've had plays that I've seen there from, like, the Hittite Empire out of California. I've seen playwrights out of uh, – and theater productions out of New York, D.C., Atlanta. Even one year there was a company that was out of London. So I definitely have to go on that website because it will start – a week from today, it'll be on the 29th is their grand opening, and then it'll run all the way until that Saturday, which I believe is the 5th. So that's oh, they always they have the this same, amazing work. They so run you the same time as the Women's Theater. So they run the same time as the Women's Theater Festival. So you can see something in Raleigh at the Women's Theater Festival and then go to Winston-Salem and see something at the Black Theater Festival, which is kind of exciting that – that um, uh, festival is sort of devoted to people who sometimes get shoved to the sidelines in the theater world. Um, uh, we have them both running in August in the state on either side of the state, which is kind of exciting. Yep. Yeah. So you can see them like, because the Women's Theater Festival will run, is that the same date, July 29th through August 
this or will it be already, a little bit uh, later? They they run all summer. They're sort of like a, a, a film festival. They put up things, um, and it's getting more and more expansive. It's a second or third year now, and um, they put up things all the way through July and August. Yeah, so pretty there'll remarkable. be some amazing work, and you're right. It is good seeing folks that are doing that positive kind of things and that are oftentimes left out of the conversation by the mainstream and everything of that nature. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm oftentimes amazed at folks that are willing to make that automatic leap to New York or L.A. or wherever the, they consider the industry to be when I think that we do some amazing work right locally and that you can make it a whole career of doing this locally. You don't necessarily have to go to L.A. or New York. Nothing wrong with going to L.A. or New York if that's your vision, but I think that you can do a whole right. life and a whole career just around this area. I, I think so too. I think it's a different. I, I think it's interesting. We were having a, that conversation at um, uh, one of my friends' uh, baby showers, one of the theater friends, and so there are lots of makers who had babies, and talking about that. That that sometimes I think that we only consider high art art when um, there's a lot of art that's happening in our homes and in our. I think that one of the most under represented represented and under respected kind of art is the stuff that's happening in churches. Yeah. There's there's a huge amount of art happening out of our church communities that people don't think of as don't give the respect that they should. Yeah. And the other thing that you did and you alluded to it earlier in the conversation and I've mentioned and I'll tie it back around to having a conversation about the owners of Copa but you mentioned that you had thought about adoption but you actually wound up having a child later in life. So I'm always glad to see when folks have that wish and are able to have that and that are healthy enough to do that because I know Elizabeth was concerned about that because she's probably, I won't say Elizabeth might be around her 40s and she's having her first child with the, her husband that owns Copa, which is the restaurant in downtown Durham. But of course he's had a well, child. Well, tell I her it, it was just the most intense yoga class I'd ever had. <laughs> That's how oh, I that's all it, later. Was. it was like it's, the most intense yoga class I'd ever taken. Yeah. But, you so know, that's, it, that's another place. Go ahead. That's another, with adoption, that's another place where economics, right, changed the kinds of choices that you did. The reason I decided um, that adoption wasn't something that we could do is in doing my research, open adoption is psychologically the best for children. Um, and it's harder on adults, but open adoption, a lot of the research shows that that's the, the easiest and most healthy way for an adopted child to sort of get a grasp on their identity and sort of avoid all the caveats of, of when it's a closed adoption and some of the psychological impact that that can have. But for open adoption, you need to hire all three lawyers. It's unbelievably expensive, and there's absolutely no support for it, no state or federal support for the economic burden that an open adoption is. So it's why we decided not to go that way is we couldn't afford it. You know, if we'd had to do IVF or we had to do adoption, they were two routes that we were not able to afford, even though we were interested in both. So you're interested in both, but we're only able to do the one route that was available to you and everything. But you're right, Right. the adoption, and I think a lot of times people get caught up in not understanding about adoption or fostering or the different other things. I know before my brother had his two kids, he was actually a foster parent to a few kids. And I remember one of the greatest incidents I ever saw was a foster kid. But you'll get a kick out of this being a teacher, was the foster kid came to our household, my mother's household, and uh, basically um, was trying to act out. Well, actually, she was not acting out. Her boyfriend was acting out. And my uh, mom gave her a uh, gave him a look, and basically it was that look that moms give people. And as <laughs> we jokingly said on as we jokingly said on the ride back, I believe he was staying in Raleigh at the time, was that that was the most quiet we'd ever seen of that kid. Because he, be, he, I want to say she may have even said something like, you know, I will take you out of here if you keep acting crazy and everything. But uh, that look and that comment that she made, he was the nicest kid on the drive back, and that might have been almost a hour and a half drive back, but or an hour drive back. But he, well, he was as quiet. He was quiet as a church mouse. <laughs> what I can say about teaching over the years 
is that that's all children really want is someone who they know notices them. And it doesn't matter if you notice them. It matters if that they know that you notice them. And I think that extra step sometimes I think we forget. Yeah, you're very right about that. I do have to tell you, though, I, see, I am afraid of one thing that you mentioned in the show earlier. Because, as you know, I'm very much busy in the cards and out in the world and everything. So I would be the kid that, or the adult that would be worried about a theater production that the lights are up. Because if you do a lot in the <laughs> art, there are times in your life where the Sandman kind of comes and visits you, even though you want to be engaged in the theater. So I'm afraid <laughs> that I would be the one that would get busted. Well, I have fallen asleep at one or two productions myself. I have to tell you, I fell asleep at um, Broadway to, to kill a mockingbird. I thought that production was horrible. I saw it on Broadway. I was mad. I spent one hundred and eighty dollars to go see it. It was. It was. I was not impressed. <laughs> I saw Hades Town in the same in the same visit, and Hades Town was unbelievable. And to kill a mockingbird, that adaptation, I couldn't understand a word Jeff Daniels said. I thought it was horrible. So I feel wow. you. <laughs> And, yeah, I was embarrassed that I fell asleep there, too. Yeah, I was like, I just fell asleep at a Broadway show. I'm a theater teacher, and that, so I'm just I'm laying it all on the show, that the show is really bad. The show is really <laughs> bad. The, when you go up to New York, and I don't know how you go up to New York, do you get a chance to see the off-Broadway stuff? Because that's where I find a lot of great theater is the stuff that's not even on Broadway, but it's kind of off-Broadway. You know, I, I do, doing. I do, and I try. Um, if I can get any tickets to anything at the public, the public and circle in the square are the two that I go to. And see, that's the other thing. And don't get me wrong. Like, I love that musicals get people in to see the theater. They're super accessible. That's fantastic. Go take your six-year-old to Matilda. But unfortunately, we only, a lot of people think that that's the only kind of theater that exists. Right? There are lots and lots of people who, when they say, I don't like theater, mean I don't like musicals. And I don't know if high school theater does as much as they could to dispel that because you've got that marketing thing that you want to sell tickets and are able to come to see a musical because they're accessible, but then you get this whole thing of like, so yeah, I, I think that there are lots of people who don't even know that the public exists. So public tickets are like, what, 50, 60 bucks? It's yep. way cheaper. Like, if you think theater's too expensive, just go see a play. <laughs> that very much. You can go see a great play and everything. I remember then we got to wrap everything up. My one theater experience that I remember was being in the drama department in high school and playing a family in a seat of cars. I want to say the teacher may have been a Durham teacher. For some reason, Haskell or Haskins is coming to mind. But he had us literally sitting up there lining up four wooden chairs together to be the car and we had to like you know pretend to open the door and be the passengers <laughs> and the whole thing and i'm sitting there going like okay this is kind of like a weird concept to get into the theater but it definitely showed me that you could create this illusion of being in a car even though it's four wooden and i'm talking about those old-fashioned wooden chairs yeah. lined up like two to get two in front of each other and two in the back i'm an empty space kind of girl i i like to have and maybe it's because I grew up in the Catholic Church, right? Like that so much of the Catholic Church is this stinky, imaginative um, projection of your spirituality. I like to be in an empty space with a whole bunch of other people and projecting um, uh, images, making it my own, making it personal. I prefer ha not having it all spelled out for me. Well, that's great. And I always great, great seeing you. I was glad that I saw you when I ran into you. And I've got to see another one of your productions soon. I know that you're friends of many of my friends as well. So I've definitely got to see you in a production very soon whenever you've got one. Or see some of your students in a production. So i got to see what East Chapel Hill High is doing. That's the only bad thing about being mass transit is that it's not hard. It's not easy to get the things that are a little bit further out like East Chapel Hill yeah. High. Well, maybe we have to work on that, that connection, that Chapel Hill-Durham connection definitely have to work on that. Uh, that's one of my big gripes. I, I've lived in Durham, have yet to be to Sackville because it's also in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I've thoroughly enjoyed having you. Dean, you got any last thoughts before we get out? And then I'll also tell you who we've got on next week. Well, go ahead and tell us who we got on and then we're going to rock from there. 
That sounds like a plan. Because next week, we're going to have a woman on. Well, I'm going to 